And there's a few minutes for questions. Andrew. <coughs> Following on from what Luke said, if people use ADOS 2, and I know there are people in the room who use it, but equally I know they know how to use it, like David, um, speech and language therapist David. Um, ADOS 2 was, um, that stands, what does it stand for? <laughs> Autism Diagnostic Observational Schedule. Okay, thank you. So it's been revised, so again, never trust anything that keeps getting revised, because we obviously got it wrong. Um, so, and we're revising that ICD-10, International Classification of Diseases. Um, I'm part of a World Health Organization internet-based study group, so I've had a sneak preview that I'm not allowed to tell you. So the ADOS-2 was primarily designed as a research tool. It was developed by some very good people in the field, Cathy Laws, Michael Rutter and so on. And it was developed to um, compare interventions for people with autism. So what they did is they gave the ADOS at the beginning and then at the end. And then they saw whether one intervention reduced the score on the ADOS. Now first of all, the premise for me is that's really wrong because it's saying that you, the intervention is successful because it's reduced a score on an autism scale. Um, secondly, it um, was only uh, done on boys and it was not done on children with Asperger's Syndrome. And I'm going to answer a question this afternoon about these different diagnostic terms, uh, so I won't go into that now. So the authors themselves critique the use of ADOS, and they all say it should never be used as a standalone diagnostic measure. But sadly, I think because, I don't want to justify this, but I think because Child and Adolescent Services are under so much pressure and have had their staffing reduced dramatically, they're resorting to doing ADOS and what's called ADIR. So again, that's been revised, so don't trust that. And that's like a developmental history type thing, which I do do. I think the developmental history is important because you hear the parents, <coughs> the family's journey and what their child has been like, and it gives you a lot of information. So I think if people want a critique of ADOS, please email me because I'm so sick to death of talking about it. I've written a critique. I've also written a critique of NICE guidelines. So when people say to you they haven't followed the NICE guidelines, please get back to me. Um, I was, I'm not showing off now, but just to say I was part of developing the NICE guidelines. Um, and it really gets on my wick when people write back to me and say you haven't followed NICE guidelines. A, the guidelines. And all the NICE guidelines clearly state at the end there is no substitute for an experienced clinician. So, again, I'm sick to death of it, so I've got a great long... Um, so if any of you need anything like that, please get back to us and we'll give that to you. But it's about changing people's beliefs. And bear in mind, neurotypical people are meant to have a really good theory of mind and really good understanding that people have... Anyway, sorry, Dick. I was just going to add to that, that even in adult services, um, I saw a lady recently who was ADOS, um, and the report I read was kind of like, yeah, this, this sounds like somebody who asked There's everything in the report, and at the end of it was like, she met one less than the numbers for all of them, and so a diagnosis wasn't given. Um, I work in mental health service, and so there was also a question whether she had something else. And so I saw her and said, no, she doesn't have anything else. She has Asperger's, but it's just not, you're just not seeing it. And I think part of the critique is, you can't say that these norms, these, these numbers, it's going to be five out of seven or whatever it is, on women, because that's not where the research was done. Okay. But I also think we're at a time where Asperger's and autism is being, is, services are being developed more, but we haven't got enough experienced clinicians no. who are then in those services. Uh, there aren't many, I was trained by them, there aren't many things <coughs> around. Um, and that's a real problem, because if your service is just being set up, you haven't got... 20 odd years of experience behind that, and, and that is an issue too. Mm -hmm. I think that's true, there's been a lot of money thrown at autism at the moment to get waiting lists down, but I don't know whether they're going to get the professionals who have got the skills to do it. Um, or the money. Or the money, yeah. yeah even, but even with the money, they're then sending people off, aren't they, else to just...
do ADOS and ADIR and that's it, that's what their service is going to be. On a, I'm not going to single the person out, but on a very optimistic note, we do have a consultant psychiatrist in this room who has made a number of very, very appropriate referrals. So let's not lose sight of the good practice that is out there as well. I do hear the bad practice, of course, but we've got some people here who I'm really pleased to come today. Martin. Is there any link between autism and psychosis? It depends who you ask. Um, I think, I'll tell you what I think, that's the only thing I can really, there's research out there that would support both. Um, you may be aware that in the, very early on, autism was thought to be a form of childhood psychosis, but we realise that's completely wrong. I think what sometimes can happen is, first of all, we don't ask the questions properly. And sometimes if you ask some people with autism, do you hear voices, they say, of course I do. Um, and then they get caught up in a bit of a tangle with the person who's asking those questions. Some, a lot of people I meet with autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia, get auditory and visual disturbance um, because of some of their sensory sensitivities. So some people I know can look at a wall and see it all peeling off. And if they don't have an explanation for that, that's quite hard to explain to others. And if they do tell people, um, so I know a lot of people when they come in, we not talking about the fluff, a lot of people who come into my room make all sorts of comments about the room, like the carpet and what that carpet might taste like, or the butterflies on my room, what, you know, all sorts of, sorry, butterflies again. Not real though. No, not real, no, not real, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the qualifier. So people's observations of the room, if they feel comfortable enough to tell, some of those experiences can sound a bit strange, they don't sound strange to me at all. Um, so I think sometimes people get those things confused. I think some people as well who have um, certain types of epilepsy, which we know is you know a, another co-occurring thing, that um, certain types of epilepsy give hallucinations, auras, visual disturbance. But again, I don't think is understood. I personally <coughs> don't think there is a link, and certainly our local early intervention team. Uh, run by Andrew Baldwin are very good at picking up people who look as if they've got psychosis but actually they've had what I call years and years of trying to cope and then they go I've had enough now and their body their mind everything shuts down and it might look <coughs> like a psychotic breakdown but in fact I think it's a lack of recognition of the dark, correct diagnosis and so those people come to me um, <coughs> And then you get calls people who are experimenting with things like cannabis and some people with autistic brains have very interesting reactions to prescribed and non-prescribed drugs. Alex. So is psychosis the same thing as schizophrenia? Um, yeah, I'm going to ask it dip. I've got a much... Well, I've also got a consultant's cartridge, but I won't dip. Would you answer that one, please? Yeah, so psychosis is the term that's the more preferred term now, and it's an umbrella term. So it covers psychosis, it covers schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, schizoids, a whole host of things. When we talk about psychosis and schizophrenia, what we're talking about is people who tend to lose touch with reality at times. So there's a cluster of difficulties that people tend to have. I guess what Luke was saying before about behaviour that you see. So you have a combination of positive and negative symptoms. So positive symptoms are things that are added to a person, like somebody starts to hear voices, somebody starts to um, have delusions, strange beliefs, that kind of thing. And also negative symptoms, which is where people can be confused as having Asperger's. Um, so uh, social anxiety, not wanting to go out, um, not having motivation uh, to do things, very much being at home and, and not being able to get up. Um, I think it, I mainly work in mental health services and I have seen people who are labeled treatment resistant schizophrenia or treatment resistant psychosis. And I think it's often because people aren't seeing an Asperger's type presentation. And that's where sensory difficulties can be part of a difference. So if somebody's had sensory difficulties throughout their life, I would be saying, well, this isn't psychosis, yeah. this, this is something else. Psychosis tends to come on around the age of between 15 and 30 ish. I mean, you do get variations in that. So if we're starting to see those difficulties much earlier on, 
it might lean us more towards an autistic spectrum condition.